Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming out on this very, very cold day in November. I'm Lisa Guernsey. I'm the director of our early education initiative here in the Ed Policy Program at New America. And I'm um, really thrilled to be able to host this conversation today. It is an incredibly timely moment to be talking about the teachers in our early care and education workforce, um, particularly because of what happened last night. So many of you in the room already know this and have been applauding it, but last night um, the Senate passed the uh, child, development, uh, child Care Development Block Grant bill. So it is on its way to the President's desk. It is definitely a step in the right direction. It's something we've been writing about here at New America. Many others um, in different groups around Washington, D.C. have also been doing a lot of good research and, and work on that. Um, but I think it's important that we all recognize that that bill did not really do it when it came to the issues we're going to be talking about today. So I'm, uh, I think this is more timely than ever to be having this conversation. So I'm going to um, start by introducing our president here at New America, uh, Anne Marie Slaughter. We are thrilled to have her. She came on board last September. It's been a fantastic year. And she's um, been doing a lot of research in the world of caregiving, in addition to her foreign policy uh, work as well. So I just want to say a big thanks to Anne-Marie and welcome her to the podium. Thank you. Honestly, when people ask me uh, some of what's, what's best about your job, one of the things I always say is being able to support Lisa Guernsey and Laura Bornfreund and all their fantastic work. It just makes me hugely proud. Uh, and I would be here for that reason alone, uh, because this is some of the most important work that New America does. But as Lisa said, I now have a very direct and personal connection uh, to this work. I, as many of you know, I wrote this article a couple years ago, Why Women Still Can't Have It All, where I was trying to say, look, we've got a long way to go yet in terms of institutional changes before we can get to real equality. Over the past two years, I've talk to, oh, I don't know, <laughs> three to 400 audiences uh, uh, on these subjects. And I've come out in a different place. I mean, a place that's consistent with what I wrote, but it's not something I expected to write. And the book that will be coming out in the spring argues that care is every bit as important as competition in all of our worlds. That we are human beings who have two basic drives. We compete, we advance our individual goals. That's what the women's movement was about, was to allow women to be defined not just as mother, daughter, sister, and wife. But that equally, we all have the impulse to care for others, uh, to uh, empower others rather than to ourselves. And in our society, we systematically devalue care. And the way you revalue care is to understand what it is. It isn't just the physical care, although that is very important, which we know. But care, if you think about philosophers, how they've written about it, uh, how human beings, how anthropologists, uh, how, how policymakers, sociologists write about it, care is in huge part education, right? Care is the enabling of others to flourish whether that is your children or whether that is your parents or extended family members or people who are not biologically related to you at all. It is that impulse that we have that we take equal pride in seeing those we love flourish. And this work, the, which is now <laughs> deeply in the middle chapter of my book, is essential because I understand from a political point of view, we want to call it early education. I get that completely and I argue for that. But what's really important is to understand that when we are caring for very little children, we are laying down the circuits, the, the, the habits, the curiosity, the, the, the ways of mind that enable them to flourish throughout their lives. There is no greater investment. You cannot tell me that managing money matters more than managing children. Not that children can be managed, in fact, <laughs> at least in my experience. But let's say then empowering, enabling, educating children. So as a mother, <laughs> as a, an activist for what I think of as real equality, a world in which men and women are equally able to care and that caring is equally valued as what we do for paid work, 
And as the head of New America, which is devoted to renewing America's, America's prosperity, politics, and purpose, this work is absolutely at the heart of it. And it, it will change the way we value each other, the way when somebody says, what do you do at a party? And you say, I work in early education. Somebody will say, wow. Somebody will assume you've had education yourself. Somebody will assume that you have unbelievable amounts of patience and skill and the ability to manage very complex situations. Someone will look at you and say, you know, as they do in other countries, you are somebody who is investing in the next generation of this country. You are somebody we should value. You are somebody we should pay. So with that, I really want to sit down uh, and listen. Uh, but as I said, I, I really don't think we do. And I, I speak from the world of foreign policy and Syria and cybersecurity and terrorism. I'm, I'm no stranger to, to many, many important threats. This is the most important work we do. Thank you. That's a great way to get started, so thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Okay, we have a jam-packed day for you, um, or morning for you, with a lot of incredibly interesting material, very timely, and some, of, some data points that you've never seen before, because some of the material that's coming out of this report um, will really, I think, open the eyes of many who have perhaps not uh, been in this conversation as much in the past, um, haven't been kind of clued into what it really means to teach young children, what it really means to ensure that the teachers of our young children are, are compensated well, and what it means to our society in terms of public costs if we're not doing what we can for those who are teaching our kids. So I want to um, just take a minute to introduce um, our two uh, presenters today who are the authors of the report that is coming out this morning, Worthy Work, Still Unlivable Wages, the Early Childhood Workforce 20 Years After the National Child Care Staffing Study. And this was, um, this report that we're going to be talking about today was written by Marcy Whitebook, Deborah Phillips, and Carolee House. All three of them are here today, which is a real thrill. These are names that I have been reading about since I was a student of this work, and to have them here and to be able to introduce them is an incredible honor. So. Um, Marcy and uh, Deborah will be speaking, and I just wanted to do a, qu a quick little introduction. Most of their um, bio is in the materials that you received as you walked in. Um, Marcy Whitebook, as many of you know, is the director of the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment at the University of Berkeley. And Deborah Phillips is professor of psychology and associated faculty in the Public Policy Institute at Georgetown University. And it is really a thrill to have them here. So thank you both, and take it away. So wonderful to see all of you here, many long time dear friends and wonderful new faces in this field. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Anne Marie and Lisa and Laura and others at New America, Carolee <laughs> and other co authors of this report, um, the center staff who were just Herculean work to get this report ready for today. Um, also, the funders of the report, the Heising Simons Foundation and the W. Clement and Jesse V. Stone Foundation. Um, thank you also to so many in the room and those who are listening in who have shared this journey with us over the last 25 years to make high quality child care a right for all children and families in the United States rather than only a fortunate experience for the few. It really is a public good and should not be left to chance. 25 years ago, Marcy Carolee and I set out to conduct a two-generation study of child care, examining both the quality of care for children and the quality of the work environment for adults who were responsible for their early development when not at home. I entered into this study as a card-carrying developmental psychologist, deeply worried about the vast variation in child care quality that children experience day in and day out in this country, um, and passionate about identifying the active ingredients that really quality was all about, that policy could affect. Little did I imagine that teacher wages would be one of the most powerful of these ingredients. I came away from the staffing study honestly shocked by the working conditions of childcare teachers. 
Salaries lower than parking lot attendance, really? And deeply touched by their commitment to the children in their care, uh, as well as by the economic precariousness of their own lives. I was absolutely convinced by the firm link we found between a, adult working conditions and what children experienced in care of the urgency of addressing early childhood teachers' compensation and well-being. I haven't changed my mind. In fact, all that we've learned in the intervening years about the exquisite sensitivity of the developing brain to the responsiveness, stimulation, and protection that young children receive from the adults in their lives, and how quickly stress and depression can undermine adults' capacity to provide the supportive and stimulating educational care has me more convinced than ever that taking care of children means taking care of their teachers. About a year ago, Marcy Carley and I began to discuss the possibility of taking stock of the state of the early care and education workforce to mark the 25th anniversary of the National Child Care Staffing Study. Uh, we couldn't begin to redo the staffing study, and we knew it would be a huge challenge to knit together a coherent story comparing the workforce in 1989 to today's workforce. Fortunately, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation in the Department of Health and Human Services has updated the 1990 profile of child care setting studies with the 2012 National Survey of Early Care and Education, giving us a 22-year window to examine, and they very generously let us dig into that data set with the help of the uh, staff at Newark um, to um, begin to take a first look at that 22-year window. Head Start has long collected data on its workforce, as has the Department of Defense. And the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics and the Census Bureau continue to collect annual data on child care workers and preschool teachers, which, as you know, is a story in its own right. I'm going to share with you what this collection of evidence reveals about the early care and education workforce then and now. Marcy will then tell you about new data regarding economic worries among early care and education teachers and their reliance on public benefits due to their poor wages. She will also share our perceptions of the current policy landscape, which in a very important way just changed last night, so my personal congratulations about that, and our thoughts about creating a pathway on this landscape toward a different future for early care and education teachers and therefore for young children. Uh, let's see, where do I? So this is our quote from the staffing study. Still true. Okay. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, as was true in 1989, childcare workers continue to land at the bottom of the U.S. wage scale. We actually pay there those who care for and educate our youngest children on a par with those who walk our dogs, flip our burgers, park our cars, and mix our drinks. Child care worker wages have barely kept pace with the cost of living, increasing by only 1% in real dollars since 1997, a smaller increase than that earned by fast food cooks. Preschool teachers in the Census Bureau linger, those who instruct preschool children in activities needed for primary school, have fared better. Their wages have increased by 15% since 1997, but they still have a long ways to go to catch up with their colleagues who do teach primary school. And there is a very unsettling contrast with what has happened to what families pay for early care and education during this same period. Census Bureau data have recently revealed that parent fees for early care and education have increased by 90%, effectively doubling since 1997. 1%, 15%, 90%. We have no idea where that money is going, but clearly not to their children's teachers. The take-home message from this figure, based on 2012 data from the Census Bureau and from the National Survey of Early Care and Education, is the exceedingly low premium that is placed on higher education within the early care and education field. 
Among teachers with bachelor's or higher degrees, those who teach kindergarten earn over 20% over more, actually 23% more than their colleagues who teach pre-kindergarten alongside them in school-sponsored settings, and 60% more than those who teach pre-K in other settings, including Head Start programs. The ex same exact stair-step pattern characterized teacher wages at the time of the National Child Care Staffing Study. Degreed teachers working with infants and toddlers still earn less than those who work with preschoolers. And comparisons to the other end of the spectrum show that early childhood teachers earn half the wages of women and one-third the wages of compar comparably educated men in the civilian labor force, respectively. How can we possibly expect to attract the best and the brightest to this field, even among those who want to teach young children? Equally striking and disturbing was the variation we saw in wages and qualifications across different sectors within our siloed early care and education market, relying on different funding streams and operating under different auspices and sponsors. Moreover, sectors of the market that were characterized by improvements in qualifications did not coincide with sectors characterized by improvements in wages. Head Start, for example, has made remarkable progress in filling its classrooms with well-trained and well-educated teachers. The majority of Head Start teachers now have a bachelor's degree in early education or a related field. And wages in Head Start did improve between 1997 and 2007, but since then they have completely stagnated despite ongoing dramatic increases in teacher qualifications. This is why we use terms like illogical, irrational, and inequitable to describe the compensation structure in early care and education. Turnover, fueled in part by low wages, continues also to produce lost investments in professional development. Over the past 25 years, our knowledge about the vital importance of the first five years of life has exploded. Our expectations of early care and education's role in closing the achievement gap have risen dramatically, and vast numbers of early education teachers have worked very hard to improve their educational credentials. And yet, we have failed to assure them wages that correspond and reward their educational levels, that will free them from economic worry, and that will enable them to support their families without relying on public benefits. And it is to these latter two stories that Marcy will now turn. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, New America. And thank all of you who are here and listening in. And I just want to call out a special appreciation to the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment staff. Fran Kipnis and Leah Austin, who are here today, and for Hina Bassi, Megan Delahoy, and Laura Sakai, who are listening in. More than four decades ago, as a recent college graduate, I chose a career as a nursery school teacher. My experience as a Head Start volunteer in high school first drew me to the child to child development and how early childhood programs could help to address poverty and um, uh, inequality. And as a young feminist, working for good care, for good child care for families seemed just an appropriate fit. I was enthralled by witnessing child development and helping to facilitate children's learning. But it quickly became apparent that there was something amiss. Many parents could not find or afford good services. Only some teachers had access to training and education. Only a handful of programs paid decent wages. And I watched one skilled teacher after another leave for other types of work. Repeatedly, I was told that I could do something more with my college degree. But I could, and I, clearly I could have made more money teaching any other age children, um, or almost in any other field. But then as now, I knew that teaching young children was essential service for our country. So along with a handful of my colleagues, some of whom are here today um, or are listening in very early in California, we set out to expand and improve child care and to secure the rights, raises, and respect for early childhood teachers that it would allow them to provide what children and families 
deserve. But as the title of our report makes clear and as our findings that Deborah just presented underscore, our efforts and those of many others, some of you in this room have joined in over the years, have not panned out as we'd hoped. It pains me that today, recent college graduates still rightly perceive early childhood teaching as a pathway to poverty. Personally for me, working one with young children was the most intellectually and physically challenging thing I ever did in my life. It is a, it's very complex work and it takes a lot of skill. Early childhood teachers need to know about typical and atypical development. They need to understand play and the role that play, play uh, is the role of play in children's learning across multiple domains, even things like building mathematical understanding and literacy. They also must help child children build skills that are important in terms of their own ability to persist the tasks and do other things that will help them succeed through life. These skills must be applied in the context of working with adults and with children and other adults who come from a variety of cultures and economic backgrounds and increasingly children who are dual language learners and children who have special developmental needs. At the same time, many of these teachers are also attending school while working full time to meet the higher expectations we have for them in the classroom and undoubtedly with the hope of improving their economic status. They're trying to, and many do, um, meet our expectations for 21st century teachers, but they're still receiving 20th century pay. And if you can't see these from back in the room, a lot of these, um, the slides are actually in the executive summary. One of the things we wanted to understand more about were the consequences of low pay against the the, uh, for in terms of economic insecurity because as Deborah said we know that stress and depression among adults um, particularly from studies of mothers affects uh, their interactions with young children. I think what we fail to recognize too often is that so many early childhood teachers are also parents whose children face the very risks associated with being poor that many of our early childhood programs seek to ameliorate. We surveyed um, 600 center-based teaching staff in one state, and they expressed worry about their family's economic well-being, and that's what this slide uh, really speaks to, as well about, as uh, worry about workplace policies that they feel like influenced their earnings. Importantly, these staff, nearly one half of whom had an associate's or higher degree, were employed in a relatively high quality sample of centers that included for profit, non profit, Head Start, and public pre K programs. In this slide, what you can see, or maybe not see, so you just have to hear what I'm saying, we see, we, we learn that those who earned less than $12.50 per hour and those with dependent children expressed more worry about having enough food for their families than their colleagues earning higher wages and those without dependent children. Even teachers with associate or higher degrees reported economic worries about their families but also are related to program policies such as being sent home without pay due to an unexpected closure of their program or low attendance. And one really important thing, I think, in the new CCDBG authorization is it addresses some of these issues about reimbursement for, un for routine absences. Significantly lower overall worry scores were found among teaching staff <coughs> em employed in higher quality programs and those that were publicly funded. Uh, overall worry expressed by teaching staff was significantly higher among those working in for-profit compared to non-profit programs. It's very troubling to imagine the stress that is induced from such worry while simultaneously being responsible for a classroom of children. Low pay not only fuels worry, but it leads many in the early childhood workforce to augment their earnings, earnings with public support. Using census data, we were able to look at, at um, participation in public support programs for those who identify themselves as child care workers. And our sample uh, for this analysis includes both home-based and family and center-based child care teachers. 
46% of childcare workers, compared to 25% of the U.S. workforce, resided in families enrolled in at least one public support program between 2000 and 2000 annually between 2007 and 2011. Our analysis focused on four programs: earned income tax credit, Medicaid and children's health insurance. Uh, SNAP or food stamps, and uh, temporary assistance uh, to needing f needy families. But in terms of TANF's par participation for the workforce as a whole, it was only 2%. Participation rates in public support programs varied li little by whether child care workers were employed full or part time. But child care workers who earned less than the proposed 1010 federal minimum wage were one and a half times more likely to ri reside in families participating in public support than were those who earned more than that. Participation rates in public support were highest among single parent child care workers and among workers with at least one child under five years old. At every level of worker education, participation in public support programs was higher for child care worker families than for the families of all other U.S. workers with comparable education. Again, under, you know, under uh, revealing the low premium placed on education for our workforce. The estimated cost of reliance on public benefits by child care workers and their families is approximately $2.4 billion per year. So, <laughs> what to do? Um, we know that um, there have been a lot of initiatives over the last number of years focused on the workforce, and most of these have really been focused on training and education, um, which is a really good thing. <laughs> um, but there seems to have been almost an implicit assumption uh, that the professional salaries will follow this education. And, uh, you know, as our data suggests, this is not true. The task of creating intentional, sustainable policies for improving the compensation and the work environments of the workforce as a whole, despite recommendations by the National Academy of Science, which you can't, probably can't read up there, but they did make that recommendation, has gone largely unaddressed. With the notable dis exception of the Department of Defense child care system that requires compensation at rates equivalent to that of other military employees with comparable training, seniority, and experience for their teachers, and select public pre-K program, pre programs that pay teachers comparably to their counterparts in K-12, through improving compensation has been left to discretionary and sporadic initiatives such as stipends that have been characterized by insufficient funding. These initiatives, well, they have important impacts and they're important to the w many in the workforce who receive them, but they mostly don't reach people in the workforce. Only a few are beneficiaries. They tend to be limited in scope, they compete for quality improvement funds with professional development and other pressing priorities, and they rely on short-term funding. So I think as Lisa, Deborah, and I all, we're all very happy about CCDBG pa being reauthorized at last and also really recognize that there's some very important protections for children um, in the new legislation. But we remain, we continue to think that we, we need a focused and compre comprehensive reassessment of the nation's early care and education system and we really need to address the financing of the system. We, we need a strategy that allows us to address the way teacher wages aligned with their educational levels across all settings from birth to five, while also relieving the tremendous cost burden that so many wo working families face. And we need everybody in this room listening in, policymakers at all levels, um, of government in concert with state, other stakeholders from business and finance leaders, parents and child care teachers themselves to really change the political will on this question so we can identify a sustainable source of funding for improving early childhood jobs that doesn't try to get parents to do it, they can't. And also that creates a rational and equitable set of guidelines for determining regionally based entry level wages and salary increases and workplace standards necessary for teachers to get engage in professional practice.
we do have something we can do right now. Um, and there are some immediate opportunities that we think provide fertile ground for making some inroads into improving early childhood employment and services. First, we think that workplace and compensation policies have to become essential features of our state's quality rating and improvement systems. They're not in there for the most part now, and it, they should become a, a benchmark of pre-K quality, which the preschool development grants we were really thrilled to see, and expansion grants made salaries a criteria, um, a salaries comparable to pre-K for pre-K and K through 12 teachers. But that should be where we're, we're we're working towards that all the time. When Head Start is next reauthorized, increased and earmarked funding for aligning teaching staff salaries with their dramatically increased qualifications should be at the center. We're really happy that the quality set aside in CCDBG has been expanded, but we feel that there needs to be some clarification around policies so that compensation initiatives are not fighting with professional development and other important efforts that they need to be dedicated um, and aligned uh, streams of money. We need to help funds to be able to, uh, we need funds to help states build and strengthen their current data system, such as workforce registry, so we can capture the extent to which members of the workforce are participating in education and professional development, receiving compensation increases, and remaining in the field. And I might add that it would have been much easier to do this report if we had more comprehensive data, and probably much easier for all of you to read it. Um, and finally, we re recommend that researchers who study um, the developmental and societal impacts of early childhood education pay much more attention to the adult working environment and teacher well-being as critical elements of developmentally supportive practices for young children and the cost benefits of early childhood settings in the short and the long term. Our nation has an uneven playing field in which the wages of teachers depend more on the ages of children they teach and where they work than on their qualifications. Economic insecurity linked to wages is endemic, especially among teachers who have children in their own. Nobody working full-time in our country, and certainly no early childhood teachers working full-time, should be worrying about paying their rent or feeding their families. We need, in the words of the 1990s Worthy Wage Campaign, to find a much better and more equitable way to help parents pay and to attract teachers and help them stay, something that our Department of Defense, a handful of state pre-K programs, and most other industrialized countries have managed to accomplish. It's our hope that this new evidence that we've reported here today and that we'll be speaking about for the rest of the morning will spur the nation to not only aspire but to achieve livable, equitable, and dependable wages for early childhood teachers, of whom we expect so very much, but we still provide so very little. My final words are that Deborah Carroll and I will not be doing the 50th anniversary report. <laughs> <laughs> But because we are we'll be are stretching our arms forward, we have chosen its title, Worthy Work, Finally Livable Wages, Early Childhood Teacher Teaching in the U.S., and let's hope it can be written before 2039. Thank you. Thank you.